There's a lot of discussion right now about COVID-19 infection numbers. And I'm seeing headlines every day about new records and daily cases for countries, U.S. states, and even in my own backyard. It's easy to be worried about this scary information, but it's also really important to understand how we should interpret it. In fact, the absolute number of cases, though important, isn't really at all what we should be focusing on. Rather, what we should care about is the percentage of tests that come back positive and whether we're doing enough testing to make this information actually useful. After all, what we really want to know is how many people in a particular area are infected with COVID-19, not how many people test positive for it. Those sound like the same thing, but they're really not. I'm Jeff Gallick, and on today's episode of Data Demystified, we'll talk about how we should be interpreting the ever-present stream of COVID-19 infection data and why we don't really care about case total counts all that much at all. When thinking about a disease like COVID-19, what we all want to know is how widespread it is. After all, that's what tells us if we should increase our efforts to stop the spread of the virus, or if we can take things a bit easier and start to reopen parts of society. The challenge is that it's almost impossible to know exactly how many people are infected, and so we use the next best thing, a sample. Basically, we can't currently test every single person in a population, so to estimate how many people are infected overall, we look to see how many people we test are actually infected. Importantly, those aren't the same thing. To make that point a bit clearer, let's take a step back and look at a different example, political polling. When we have an election, what we're doing is asking everyone to vote and pick a candidate for some political office. That's great, but if we want to get a sense of how that election will go in advance, we typically conduct a political poll or survey. What that means is that we ask a few people who they plan to vote for, and then assume that those people, more or less, reflect the voting intentions of all voters. In fact, this strategy for the most part yields very accurate results when done well. Let's look at a very simple example to see how this would work and what some pitfalls might be. To keep things simple, let's assume there are 10,000 people who will vote in an election between two and only two candidates, a Democrat and a Republican. Here, the big box is going to represent all the people that are going to vote. And yes, I know that the world isn't this simple, but simplifying things can help us understand more complex settings, so bear with me. Let's also assume that exactly half of our 10,000 voters plan to vote for the Democrat candidate, represented by the side of the box shaded blue, and the other half plan to vote for the Republican candidate, represented by the side of the box shaded red. And again, yes, I know that this would result in a tie, but just go with it for now. In advance of the election, we might want to know who's likely to win, so we conduct a political poll. We call up some subset of those people, say 500 of them, and ask them who they plan to vote for. Here, the smaller box represents the sample of people we ask to tell us who they plan to vote for. In a perfect world, our 500 people split perfectly down the middle, between Democrats and Republicans, and so our result from the survey is that we predict that the vote will be split 50-50, which is a perfect prediction of what will actually happen. Great. No issues here at all. But let's consider two slight variations to this example. First, let's imagine that the 500 people we asked to tell us who they plan to vote for aren't perfectly split between Democrats and Republicans. Let's say that by some stroke of bad luck, we instead ask 200 Democrats and 300 Republicans. Remember that regardless of which 500 people we ask to tell us their voting intentions, the original 10,000 people will still vote the exact same way. It's just that now we happen to ask a few too many Republicans, given what we know about how many Republicans are in our population. So now we see that the smaller box has shifted towards the red side. If we use the results of the new sample of 500 voters to predict the election, we would predict that the Democrat candidate will only receive 40% of the vote, or 4,000 votes, and the Republican candidate will receive 60% of the vote, or 6,000 votes. The problem here is that our prediction is going to be way off of what will actually happen, all because the people we asked didn't really reflect the entire population of voters in our hypothetical election. That's a problem. We want to know who's going to win, but because we didn't do a great job of making sure that our sample of voters reflects the population, our estimate is going to be way off. Of course, in the real world, political pollsters go to great lengths to make sure that the people who they ask to tell them their voting intentions match the entire voting population as well as possible. They don't always get it dead right, but they tend to be pretty close. What I want you to realize here is that we don't really care at all about who the people in our sample are going to vote for. 
We only care about them to the extent that they tell us something about who the entire population is going to vote for. If the sample is a good representation of the population, then great. If not, as is the case here, that sample is really worthless in telling us about the thing we care about, who's going to win the election. The second thing to consider is that what matters a lot in having that sample be useful in telling us about who's going to win the election is how many people we actually poll. Imagine if instead of asking 500 people to tell us who they plan to vote for, we instead only asked 20 people. Well, if we even slightly made a mistake and asked just one extra Republican who they would vote for, that would result in us seeing 11 intended votes for a Republican and 9 intended votes for a Democrat. That's a prediction of 55% of the votes going to the Republican and 45% going to the Democrat. Clearly, given that we know that the vote is really going to be 50-50, this is a huge error in predicting who will win, driven by us accidentally asking just one extra Republican who they would vote for. The same isn't true if our sample is really big. Let's say we ask 5,000 people who they will vote for. Now the room for error really shrinks. Let's say we're again off by just one person. We see that in our sample, now 2,501 people say they'll vote for the Democrat, and 2,499 say they'll vote for the Republican. Well, that's fine, because that just predicts that the Democrat will really get 50.02% of the vote, which is really close to reality. So when we sample more people, our room to mess up shrinks. So what you can see is that when the box is small, when we've only tested a few people, that box can move around a lot in our population, which means that there's lots of chance for us to make a mistake. That's just not true when the box is really big. When it's large, meaning we sample lots of people, there's less room for that box to move around. And that means there's less room for us to make a mistake, which is all the more reason that we need to have more testing. One extra thing to point out is that the absolute number of votes in our sample really doesn't matter at all. What matters is the percentage of people saying they'll vote for each candidate. In the previous examples, if we focus on the voters planning to vote for the Republican candidate, we don't think that the candidate will only get 11 votes in the first example, but 2,499 in the second example. We hopefully realize that the absolute number of votes in our sample doesn't matter at all. What matters is how many votes the Republican candidate will get relative to the Democrat candidate in the entire population. That is, for predicting who will win an election, we only care about the percentage of the votes for each candidate, not just how many there are in total. And now, you might be wondering why we're talking about political polling in a video about COVID-19 case counts. And the answer is that if we understand the types of errors that could occur in political polling, we can understand very quickly why tracking the absolute number of cases of COVID-19 doesn't really matter. But what really matters is the percentage of cases that come back positive. And beyond that, we hopefully also realize that to get any sense of how prevalent COVID-19 is, we need to do a lot of testing. Let's see just why that's true. First, unlike in our voting example, in reality we don't know how many people are infected, and our best way to estimate this is to test a bunch of people and see how many people test positive. Importantly, it's not just how many people in total test positive, but rather what percentage of people test positive relative to those who test negative. Let's look at our box again, except this time, to keep it simple, the big box will represent the population of people in a hypothetical US state with a million people in it. We'll color code the box to represent how many people are infected with red being infected and green being not infected. What's really important though, is that we really don't know what the split looks like. I'm just going to pick an infection rate of 20% to make the example easy, but it's important to remember that in the real world, we don't know what the true infection rate in the population is. We'll need to estimate that, which is what we're about to do. Just like with our political polling example, we can try and estimate how many people in the entire state are infected based on what percentage of people that are tested are infected. In a perfect world, we are just as likely to test people who are and aren't sick, and we can test a lot to be very confident in our estimate. So let's say we test 50,000 people, and we perfectly match our sample infection rate to the true population infection rate. In other words, we find that 20% or 10,000 of those who are tested are infected. Well, then our testing is a dead match for reality, and we can say that we have a good grasp of how much viral spread there is in our state. Already, we should see why the absolute number of infections doesn't matter at all here. If we only tested 500 people and 100 of them were infected, we'd still think that 20% of our entire state was infected. The number of infections of those we test is really irrelevant in understanding how many infections there are overall. What matters, again, is the percentage of those we test that come back positive. 
So when you see headlines saying that a state reported something like 10,000 new cases in a single day, that sounds scary and terrible, but what really matters is knowing how many people were tested. If the state conducted 20,000 tests and half came back positive, that tells us that there's a decent chance half of the entire state, or half a million people in our example, are actually infected. If instead they conducted 100,000 tests, that tells us that only 10% of the state, or 100,000 people, are likely infected. Still not good, but a whole lot better than half a million. So again, absolute numbers are impressive to talk about, but what really matters is the percent positive. The problem, however, is that just like with our polling example, there are two big ways that testing can give us poor estimates of how many people are infected in the entire population. The first major problem we have is that those who get tested aren't likely to be a perfect representation of the population. This is really important because the way we try and learn about the population infection rate is by saying that if some percentage of those tested are infected, then it's likely that the same percentage of the population is also infected. The problem is this assumes that we are just as likely to test people who are infected as those who aren't. However, if you're having symptoms of COVID-19 or were around someone who is infected, you're more likely to get tested. That means that the percent positive of the people who are infected is likely an overestimate of how many people in the population are actually infected. Let's see why. Let's take the extreme case and say that we conducted 10,000 tests and the only people who get tested are those who are in hospital with severe COVID-19 symptoms. That means that nearly 100% of those tested will be found to be infected. But does that mean 100% of the population is infected? Of course not. Instead, it just means that we're only testing people who are really likely to be infected. Let's relax that case a bit and say that we are testing people who are at the hospital and anyone else they had contact with. Now we're likely to find a smaller percentage rate, say 80%. Again, that doesn't mean that 80% of the population is infected, just that we are testing people who are more likely to be sick. As we increase the amount of testing we do, we move away from only testing people who are highly likely to be infected and more towards all people. That means as we test not just people who are likely to be infected, we get to a better understanding of how many people in the population are infected. This is particularly true for COVID-19 since experts believe that as many as 80% of all infected people experience either mild symptoms or are totally asymptomatic, but can still spread the disease to others who might have far more dire consequences. So the first problem is that if we only test those who are likely to be sick, we're likely to get a big overestimate of how prevalent COVID-19 is. The second problem is one of insufficient testing in general. Just like in our election polling example, if we only test a few people, even tiny fluctuations in whether we test an infected or uninfected person can dramatically skew our understanding of how many people in our entire population actually have COVID-19. As an aside, for the sake of this video, I'm going to assume testing for COVID-19 is perfect and never makes any mistakes. Though have a look at one of my other videos talking about how testing accuracy is far from perfect. I'll link to that below. Anyway, we can see that in a perfect world, our sample mirrors the population. That is, if 20% of people in our sample come back as being infected, that means that 20% of our population is also likely infected. But that box representing the sample can move around just by random fluctuations. Let's imagine we only test a few people, say 100, and we just so happen to test a few extra uninfected people. Say we find that of our 100 people, only 15 are infected and 85 are uninfected. That's only five extra uninfected people tested, but what that tells us is that our population infection rate is 15%, when in reality is it's 20%. That's a huge error. For our population, a 5% difference is 50,000 people. The same doesn't happen if we test a lot of people. Say we test 100,000 people, and we again test five extra uninfected people by accident. That means we'll have 19,995 infected people and 80,005 uninfected people which means we'll think that the infection rate in the population is 19.99%, which is pretty close to the true value of 20%. The point is that when we test more, we can be more confident in our estimate of the population infection rates because there's less room for error. Taking these two issues together, I hope that helps you understand why we need more testing. Because testing just a few people could lead us to big errors in understanding how prevalent a disease is. Also, I hope you see that what mostly matters is the percent positive result, and not just the absolute number of cases. Percent positive, if our testing is ubiquitous enough, is what really tells us how prolific COVID-19 is. Seeing raw numbers is what makes for attractive news headlines and sensational stories, but it's not what really matters. What matters is knowing what the population infection rate is, so that we can take appropriate policy and personal decisions to fight this global pandemic. If you found this interesting, 
please take a moment to like the video and subscribe to this channel. Also, if there are topics in the world that involve data and you want to get a better intuitive understanding of them, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to create content meant just for you, my viewers.